Hello and welcome to day 69 of 365 Days Towards Racial Change. My name is Thomas Nyback. Thanks for tuning in once again with us. We're here discussing black issues in America, white life, and how these two uh, groups interact and mingle. Um, as I go through this series, I'm finding myself educated uh, in, in very practical ways in real time as I... Uh, Approach this subject. Uh, so, for our introduction, two major thoughts I'd like to get across. First thought has two parts. First part is uh, Does the black mind of slavery, uh, privation, vulnerability prevail, get passed down from generation to generation by whatever means? And does white uh, privilege and uh, power, entitlement get passed down from generation to generation? I happen to stumble onto a video today that may bear some proof uh, to support those uh, two veins of thought. And the other thought is, uh, are black Americans playing the financial game properly? Most of the motivation we have here is to get uh, again, uh, in the mainstream of the financial pulse of one of the most wealthiest nations on earth, which is kind of an oxymoron because if we understand money, we understand money is built on nothing. It's created out of thin air, really. Uh, so we need to slow down, understand Federal Reserve, how banks work, international banking, inflation, all these terms, they, they don't, they shy away from these terms in school that they, they gladly tell you about a bank account and uh, skim over interest rates, but they don't tell you how powerful that is. And it's powerful, it impacts the black life because uh, it's why we work so hard and it's um, why there's uh, never enough, why retirements run out. Um, we need this education, we need some financial language. So that's part, another part of why we are here. I am uh, motivated, inspired by a man named Dr. Claude Anderson. I read three of his books. First book was a black history reader, 101 questions you never got to ask. We reference all these books, uh, by the way, heavily. And you can find his videos on YouTube. You yeah, find them at powernomics.com. And he's part of the Heritage Institute in Washington, D.C. Second book I read was Black Labor, White Wealth, Search for Power and Economic Justice. And we are going through a series in Dr. Anderson's book, Poweronomics, a National Plan to Empower Black America. All relevant stuff. Uh, so we're going through a series of some political action steps uh, that blacks can take. Oh, to make some noise. <laughs> Uh, I think you get know what that means. Also, we're going to have we have story time every once in a while. We'll probably get back to check in on Uncle Tom, Harriet Beecher Stowe's phenomenal work from the mid 1800s about the life of one black slave named Tom. Although she does give uh, some references to some peripheral lives, uh, lives are complicated in there. So we're going to check in on Tom. Although last we checked. We were focusing on Eliza and uh, her young son, Harry. They had just run away, so we're, we need to find out what's going on with them. It's how far have they gotten uh, out there. Hashtag us too is black women hanging out here, I believe. Uh, last time I checked. Um, it's open to everyone, of course. Uh, black enough, B-L-A-G-G-E-N-U-F. Another space to um, fellowship. Kind of a black Facebook. And since it's the internet, if you found me, you can find all kinds of great stuff on the internet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let's get into day 69 here. I'm Thomas Nyback. Uh, day 69, we're looking at step eight, mobilizing reparations movements to place blacks uh, in the status equal to American Indians with legal claims and stuff, such like that is uh, his vein of thought here in this section, but that's that's one idea of reparations is to 
amend, amend the black relationship with America uh, to the point where it is rightly situated at, at just as uh, America has done with the Native American, the Indians, um, those indigenous people that were here. And so that's one aspect of reparations to, to put us in a class along with them and uh, give us land and maybe some reservations or whatever we need. You know, the black folks didn't get, they just turned us out and kept abusing us, uh, at least even after Trail of Tears and all, a lot of, lot of abuse that the Native Americans, had, I mean, they got uh, decimated way back to the Stone Age. They're, they're still recovering, even with casinos and a lot of good stuff. They're in politics, but they're still recovering from the, the devastation that white man put them through. Uh, so I, you know, I don't talk too bad about them. I have some Native American blood in my veins, so I, I don't talk too bad about them. I, I'm just disturbed that they receive so much <clears throat> apart from blacks, you know. And, and Dr. Anderson notes uh, we'll we'll find, you know, ever as we go through the material, uh, Native Americans, some of them, or were aided um, white folks and capturing and murdering blacks. They knew blacks were unarmed and lost here in this American land as being a slave. So we'll, we'll talk about some of that. So that's one aspect of reparations. Another aspect of reparations is, where's our 40 acres and our mule? And then if we got it, you know, uh, did jealous white men poison uh, and impede, uh, inflate prices, make life hard, uh, uh, keep us subservient uh, through Jim Crow, semi-slavery, things like that. A lot, a lot of wicked stuff that this nation uh, just perpetuates. You know, I just came from a space. I won't go much into it, but you know, there was no black leadership, no black representation. Um, you know, it was a money thing, and uh, uh, but I needed a learning experience, so I, you know, I invested that. And I feel like I came away with with my eyes wide or open. I feel like I'm armed, and I can have some better conversations around the subject I was attending. But it's over and over. It's just it's so uh, society, America especially, is just so woven in. <coughs> You know, for blacks, you're either non-threatening or, or you're uh, uh, too much of a challenge uh, to white entitlement and power. And, and it's just too bad we just don't all more consistently work with, alongside one another uh, to make things happen. So that's the two sides of reparations. One side of reparations, which we'll lean on heavily tonight, is uh, equating black needs with Native American needs, that's going to come up a lot. Um, and we're going to see some other examples of nations that have been compensated for, for stuff. And then the other side of reparations is the 40 acres and the mule, uh, you know, not civil rights and social immigration and the symbols and stuff that, you know, uh, we need some hardcore, we need some tangible assets. You know, that's what everybody but blacks have gotten. So we're working on that. All right, so there's a need for compensation from slavery, semi-slavery, Jim Crow, semi-slavery. I'm just, I'm watching one of my favorite movies, Cool Hand Luke. Now, this is about the, the white chain gang and stuff like that. And I, I get it, but it's also, <coughs> uh, it could easily be, can make all the characters black, and it would probably be more appropriate. Well, all the ch all the prisoners black, you know, the bosses and wardens and stuff uh, would be white. Um, so the Jim Crow semi-slavery, you know, a, a lot of laws came out, you know, vagrancy laws and all this oppression, um, uh, uh, you know, massive uh, jail terms for minor offenses, lynching, things like that, you know just twisting the black 
individual round and round. It's, uh, you know, I, it's sad that I'm speaking a truth about a nation that uh, has so much potential. Uh, so there's been some need for compensation, just even on those points, you know, not just reparations equating us with another race or class of people, but we got we got some a lot of skin in the game um, as far as you know proof of our sweat and blood under the sun exposure. You know. um, so we got uh, he's got a list here of people who receive you know money status. So something tangible um, for either being victims or repairing their countries after war, things like that. Let's listen to some of this. White indentured servants, uh, they have freedom dues, southern slaveholders, monetary reparations, and, and whatnot. And uh, um, and whatnot, and all kinds of uh, foolishness for these people. Uh, Japan got m money. Uh, Germany for rebuilding. Japanese Americans for the internment. Uh, Jews uh, were gifted from their uh, German Holocaust. And those survivors, and of course, we mentioned American Indians. Even cigarette smokers, he's got down there. Uh, you know, because this country, you know, <laughs> they purposely made cigarettes even more addictive and stuff like that. And, and then they got proved <laughs> dumbass white people. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so, you know, we mentioned that just a lot of groups, except blacks, get that kind of fair treatment. It, that's that's stupid. Um, so we you know we could use Japanese and uh, Native American mo as models for some of this stuff. Um, a few contrasts uh, between the Native Americans, and Blacks, and Native Americans sought and received public apologies from state and federal governments. Uh, blacks need to seek the same. I, I think maybe the Senate made some gesture years ago, and then there's a lot of tokens out there, and, and then what's it look like, how public is it, uh, things like that. Well, and I mentioned, you know, we need holidays, and we need um, uh, days of recognition, we need ways to show the world that we agree with whatever little progress we, we made in some area. We, we just don't do that. Every, Everybody else has some some right or something they celebrate. Uh, blacks just don't have that. We, we try Kwanzaa and we try Ebonics with our language, and you know nothing sticks for us black folks. Uh, you know, even in my personal life, I find I can't focus. Maybe that's a spillover from uh, my slave ancestors passing on. Uh, some attitudes, beliefs, uh, intuitively towards me, uh, you know, in, in some kind of mysterious way. Uh, a few other contrasts, uh, uh, Native Americans uh, have their own uh, civilized tribes constitution. Uh, uh, we, the blacks should have an empowerment plan, something, uh, some document to adhere to uh, to demonstrate some unity, uh, some focus, uh, a plan, a path uh, that most of us, in which most of us are moving, we, we just we just don't have that. You know, uh, Native Americans declared themselves to be a foreign nation, and they made separate communities, and you know they have reservations and all that. I've I've seen kind of the outskirts of some. Well, you know, some reservations are challenging places and things like that. But he says also, you know, the blacks should declare 
themselves, ourselves, a nation within a nation and rebuild black communities. You know, right? We got Rosewood, Tulsa, a lot of other communities were sacked um, just from through some slight infraction. Uh, maybe a black man looked at a white woman wrong or some word was instant, uh, misunderstood. And here you go, this mass lynching, burning, dismembering, rape uh, of whole com black communities that were thriving, that had businesses, um, got commerce going on in there. But here comes jealous white folks to come and destroy all that. You know, he notes that Congress, Congress has some power to uh, get get some of these awards. Native Americans have uh, casinos and stuff. You go through uh, New Mexico, up up and down I twenty five every month. Uh, you know, there's a few casinos up and down that strip, you know, and that, I, I think that that money, that whole enterprise is immune from IRS and all that stuff. It's a, um, they're, they're a nation there. They are wrecked that space, commerce, revenue, that's all theirs, you know, so uh, blacks need that kind of thing. It's not like we'd be missing, you know, it's not like oh, at the heyday of labor intensive. This is the information age. And um, so this hands-on stuff is, is going away. I'm at the tail end of the blue collar world in America. It's, it's interesting to know where I'm at in this. Um, <laughs> would have been nice to maybe be born 50 years earlier. Or 50 years later, but this this living on the cusp is a challenge for me. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of the things that I grew up hoping on, believing in, uh, they vanished um, and whatnot. You know, but uh, blacks would have served themselves, their community better had uh, we been more assertive and focused in obtaining some stuff. You know, even though we've had we've had communities sacked and we get betrayed and there's slavery and all that, we're we're not stupid people, you know. We um, we don't lack ability. We might lack opportunity uh, grossly to a great degree, but we don't lack ability. Um, so we, we should get these things together, get moving, you know. But uh, we're, we're, well, there's too many of us blending in. Um, I feel I'm more independent now, but I, I had my blending in years and stuff. And a lot of that's carried over uh, into the music I listen to. Um, uh, even my drug history and alcohol, you know, while it may be... Uh, you can, uh, you're not supply, surprised to hear a black man say that, uh, but I, I was introduced to all that stuff through white folks, you know, um, so that's something to think about. So, but Congress has this ability to award some funds, space, um, uh, special laws uh, for black folks. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't get done, and that, that's very disturbing. Um, and he says the Indians, Native Americans, are getting benefits that go back centuries, which is very true. We just talked about uh, casinos and whatnot. Um, and finally, we need uh, black folks need to watch out. For what Dr. Anderson said, he calls Samboism, and it's that uh, it's that black person that's going to abuse and disrupt 
the system, the status quo, every chance they get. They, uh, there's a word we use in New Jersey. I'm not going to say it because it's a private word. It's a word we know each other by a certain community <laughs> uses this word. Uh, so I've, I've stopped educating people about it. I'm not going to use it here. <clears throat> uh, but my people know, if I said it, people would know what I'm talking about. The point is, this person is very disruptive, and their, their joy, their life, their fulfillment is in bringing chaos into peace and order. Man or woman, any age. <laughs> Something about black, this type of black person. But uh, it's in Harriet Beecher Stowe's work, a man named Sambo is like that. Um, so he finishes this section, uh, you know, with us, with, with his desire, his uh, his wish for black folks to gather and uh, make some stuff happen together. Uh, by he says he gives us warnings, you know, but not only is there going to be pushback backlash from a white power entitlement power structure there uh, in America that there's going to be the Sambos um, and, and they're not going to be you find a lot of them in the lower economic echelons but, uh, but I guess I'm guessing he's talking about some of our uh, unique elite Financial black stars, you know, our game show uh, star, our um, our celebrities, athletes, um, people that like, you know, they they made it to the point where that they don't get any why there's any complaint, why there's any resistance, like Colin Kaepernick and stuff like that. You know, they don't get it. Why, why are you so messed up? You know, you're, you know, you're a millionaire and stuff like that. You know, it's because we're disenfranchised, we're marginalized. You know, wake up, dude. I don't care how much billions and trillions you make, how popular you are. You're black. You're a descendant of slaves, and you are your um, status is fixed. No matter how much resources you can muster, gather, and all that, you're always going to be a part from white superstructure elitism in America. Yes, yes, you are. Yes, you will. <laughs> I'm Thomas Nyback. Thanks for sticking around. That's day 69 out of the way. Come back and uh, we'll continue. We got a couple more days on these political action steps. Thanks for sticking around another day. See you tomorrow.